Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this Holzbrink online discussion, making sense of and in senseless times. My name is Berit Ebert. I'm head of programs here at the American Academy. Under normal circumstances, um, I would be standing downstairs in our lecture room in front of a lectern. I would be giving the introductory remarks. Um, then you would listen to a wonderful conversations between our, our uh, panelists tonight. And after that, we would probably gather on the terrace, um, which is right now to my left, um, and we would all be enjoying a glass of wine together and each other's company. However, um, the current situation has ushered in a shift um, in how we communicate, and therefore, you are all today witnessing um, what can be only described as a world historic event, um, the American Academy's first live and online discussion. Um, this enables us to include a lot of friends who are not only in Germany, but um, scattered across Europe and also the United States. And although I do not see you right now, um, I want to give a very special warm welcome um, to our trustees, Gail Berg, Christine Wallach and Gerhard Kasper, as well as um, so many alumni um, and former fellows who are joining us um, today from the United States. Um, so with that, the Academy does not only go Monday, the Academy goes worldwide and um, with our three speakers for, um, for today. And these are writer and Holzbring fellow Paul Lafarge, um, who is joining us from New York. Hi, Paul. Hello. <laughs> um, writer and journalist Jan Brandt in Berlin. Hello. And Simone Schröder, also in Berlin. Before we start the conversation, <laughs> Um, let me briefly introduce the three. Um, Paul is the author of The Artist of the Missing, which was published in 1999, Hausmann or the Distinction, published in 2011, The Facts of Winter in 2005, Luminous Airplanes in 2011, and most recently, The Night Ocean, which was published in 2017. His writing appeared in The New Yorker, Village Voice, The Harpers, among others only. And in the academic year 2016-17, Paul was the Picarder guest lecturer at the University in Leipzig. He's currently, as I've mentioned before, the Holzbrink Fellow at the American Academy. Um, Jan is the author of Gegen die Welt, published in 2011, which won the Nicolas Born Debut Prize and was shortlisted for the German Book Prize. He is also the author of three memoirs, Death in Turn, published in 2015, City Without Angels, published in 2016, and A House in the Country, slash An Apartment in the City, published in 2019. His second novel to be published in 2021 is about a German family who emigrated to the United States. Simone Schröder, our moderator today, um, completed a PhD in comparative literature at the University of Bath and has been working with the International Literature Festival since 2017. Her book, the Nature Essay, Eco-Critical Ex Explorations, was published in 2019. Simone is also the German translator of Paula Forge's fact Facts of Winter. Um, I hope you have all written down the titles I just read, um, because now you have a good reading list for the next one or two months, I think. Hmm. Um, in our discussion today, um, Paul, Jan, and Simone will explore the various ways in which fiction writers in the pandemic world will have to make sense of a society in which familiar social structures collapse overnight and shared ideas about reality are politicized and polarized in many ways. After their conversation, um, you all will have the possibility um, to join us in a Q&A um, you have on uh, the bottom on the right side of your screen, the Q&A bottom, and you will be able to type in your questions. Um, the panelists will try to tackle them. Poor Simone will have to follow um, them and will uh, summarize a few of them if she will not come to, um, to, uh, to, to actually put forward all of them. Um, I will vanish now so that you have the three stars um, on the screen. And um, Simone, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate today. And uh, with that, thank you and good luck. Yeah, thank you, Barrett, for this kind introduction. And um, welcome to this event, everybody. I can't see you, but I know you're there and I'm happy that you're there. Um, 
I'm also happy to be moderating this event today. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the whole team of the American Academy for making this possible, for organizing everything. So thank you, Caitlin, Johanna, Mareike, and Barrett for doing this. It wouldn't be possible without you. And thank you also to the American Academy. It's really a wonderful institution. Sadly, we can't be there today at Wannsee, but we are in spirit. Um, tonight, as Barrett already said, we're joined by two wonderful authors. One of them is German, the other is American, and um, the three of us are going to talk for pro approximately 40 minutes. And after that, you will have time to ask questions. And as Barrett already said, asking in these days means typing questions um, into, into the Zoom chat function. But I'm sure we'll manage fine. And um, I will let you know once the time is to submit questions. But you can already think about um, possible questions that you have for our speakers while we talk. And the whole e event will then finish by around 6 o'clock. Berlin time, that is. All right, then, uh, let's begin. Uh, um, Barrett has kindly already introduced Paul and Jan. So um, all I, I have to ask is, uh, Jan and Paul, you, you have already met. And is it true that you first met in a New York City bar? Um, yes. I, I'm, more, I'm more embarrassed by it than Jan is. But, uh, we, we I, there was a, a reading series in New York City that required the readers to take public risks to do things that they would find humiliating and or uh, horrifying in their regular lives. And I was unfortunately a reader that evening. Um, and my, my decision regarding the public risk was to eat a rather large quantity of wasabi, which is the green spicy horseradish that comes with Japanese food. And I'd found a trick where you could do it without uh, having your head explode. So I did that to everyone's great astonishment. Um, and then I, I turned bright green and had to uh, exit the stage in a hurry uh, because my, my trick hadn't worked quite as well as I had hoped. And so for me, it was a, it was a, a lesson in writers maybe uh, sticking to what they know how to do rather than undertaking things like eating uh, large quantities of very spicy horseradish. And I, I've been a little embarrassed by the whole thing ever since, but Jan was nice enough to tell me that he didn't feel bad for me. Um, and of course, because it was such a weird and, and stupid thing to do, uh, it, it's probably the only thing anyone will remember me as having done. You know, you 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 are my wasabi hero since then. Uh, I didn't yeah. know that you uh, try to use a trick. Uh, oh yeah, there's a trick. Means that you are able to uh, to digest it. The wasabi. Well, you know, I do have I have a novelist's constitution, so I'm used to digesting the indigestible. <laughs> but no, Jan, but also, also Jan did you also did you also have to do a challenge, or were you just in the audience? No, I was just um, gladly. I was just in the audience, uh, but I was thinking about what would I have done when I was uh, on stage, uh, and I think I would like, you know, something do as embarrassing, as, like uh, you know, I, I didn't find uh, eating a bowl of wasabi embarrassing, uh, but I would <laughs> like dress like a Bavarian native or something, mm -hmm. or something like that, you know, which something which is considered uh, to be typical German, although I'm not coming from Bavaria, but from the opposite side, from uh, Ostfriesland, and East Frisia, but we don't have like kind of traditional dresses, which are well known in the outside world. It's definitely a lovely story how, how the two of you met. Thank you for sharing it. Um, the theme of our conversation today is making sense of and in senseless times. And I believe that you, Paul, came up with this title. Was it inspired by your experience of the last three months? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I uh, went very quickly to the word senseless, which describes an experience of living through uh, times that are, uh, where things are uh, sort of large 
and seemingly immutable things are changing very quickly. And so the whole process of building structures by which to understand them gets a little uh, undermined. So I was in Berlin until the 9th of March, um, very happily uh, working away at the academy and enjoying my fellowship and the, uh, the, the beautiful environment and the uh, truly wonderful food and the, the support of this incredible staff. And then I went back to New York for what I thought would be a couple of days. And it turned out that those couple of days were the days during which uh, international air travel ceased to be a possibility. And by the time I was scheduled to fly back, I was no longer able to return. And I've been, I've been in upstate New York ever since. There hasn't really been a, a way to come back to the academy. So I, I underwent this very abrupt and, and rather, I don't know, uh, unsettling shift. And then, of course, everything else, you know, I mean, I was, this was the least of anyone's problems and really probably the least of my problems also. Uh, the, the, everybody's lives have just been upended by the pandemic. People have had to, to resituate themselves. People have had to completely rethink their ways of doing things. People have had to adapt to circumstances which are, are much more difficult than the ones that I, I had to adapt to. But it does put a, a strain on your sort of understanding of the, the narrative of your world and of your life. You know, you, you think, oh, I was, you know, I was going along like in this direction and now clearly I'm not going in that direction, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure where I am going. Um, and in the United States, I think it was easy to be uh, really anxious and really uh, uncertain about the state of the world because the, the pro political discourse has been so incoherent and amateurish and, and haphazard and, and in cases just frustrating and misleading. Um, so that, that there's no public institution which is making sense for us of what happens or there are several institutions and they're making sense in different ways. And I remember listening to the radio, you know, in the first weeks of the pandemic and the national public radio is usually soothing to the point of, you know, like really being soporific. It's a great way to, to unwind if, you, or if you're having trouble sleeping. But in this case, they're just relating the news without being able to contain it within any framework uh, in which they can tell us that things will be all right. There was no kind of narrative that they could impose on this story, which would make us feel okay about the story. There wasn't a way to say, well, it's all for the best, or it's all sort of part of some narrative of American progress or some narrative of resilience or triumph. It was really just like lots and lots of people are dying. We don't know what's going to happen. In New York City, the healthcare system is overwhelmed and people are, are on cots in the, the corridors of our hospitals. We don't have enough equipment to save their lives. And we don't really know what's going to happen. So there was this, this kind of pervasive feeling of, um, I, I don't know how to describe it, of, of everything being very open, of it being very hard to figure out uh, where the story was going, which has obviously compounded in the last four or five weeks with the death of George Floyd, and then these massive nationwide protests, uh, beginning with like police riots. <laughs> and then protest surprisingly against police brutality, which make the, the sort of direction of the uh, public life even harder to understand and which, which kind of amplify the, amplifies the conflict um, in the narrative surrounding public life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Is this an experience that you shared, Jan, in the, in the past weeks, this lack of a coherent story of, um, about the, the current situation? Well, yes, uh, I'm part of it. Um, um, when Paul and I met each other in Berlin in February, we didn't talk about the pandemic. We didn't talk about the virus. Um, and my feeling that was in, in February that nobody really uh, 
realized what was going on. It was still something which was going on in China. And I remember our health minister, he said something like, uh, uh, in, in the middle, um, mid-February, he said something like, uh, pandemic is like uh, an irreal uh, imagination. And um, so, but um, I don't know, I think that we got, in Germany, we got sensitized by what happened in Italy. Uh, and, um, you know, th there was the first major shutdown. And, um, and I think that we kind of reacted to, to that much sooner than uh, the American government. And um, so um, I think that th this, this changed a lot in, in, in a very short time. But still, I think that there was a problem with the uh, narrative. I mean, people told me that they feel like being in a kind of science fiction movie or science fiction story, that, that something which is like fiction just came true because they, they couldn't imagine that this would happen in reality. And so I think there's a kind of gap between these two worlds in our um, uh, mind, you know, that, that so, so many people were shocked that this could happen, uh, uh, which was just a fantasy of like science fiction writers before. And, um, and so people started to, um, yeah, to, to make interpretations uh, and suddenly we, we relied on experts more than on politicians uh, or other people in the public sphere. And I think everyone was longing to, to, to know what's going on, to, to have a bigger knowledge. And the question is also, um, if reality seems so fictitious, then how does literature respond? And you, Jan, have had the opportunity um, to write about COVID-19 for a German radio station. And you could have written a short story or some other piece of fiction, but you decided to do an interview with a health worker. Can you talk about this decision? Well, they asked me to write about my corona uh, life, like, like a diary, you know, what, what are you doing? And I thought, this is not relevant. You know, I'm sitting at home, I'm writing. For me, my professional life uh, hasn't changed much. So I, I thought that we have to ask people who are dealing with corona crisis, uh, like, like who are dealing with people who come in sick or, you know, the healthcare workers who are underpaid anyway and uh, who are the first people who got in, in touch with, with this virus um, and uh, with, with the kind of um, result of a, a false policy. And so I, I did interviews with um, yeah, nurses and, um, and I, what I did was like a kind of monologue of one of the nurses, um, how she's reacting to this. And uh, she told me that she's not working with the with uh, COVID-19 uh, patients, but uh, with um, uh, supposedly uh, cancer patients and uh, uh, all the operations or all the kind of things they had to do, uh, the preparations in hospital are kind of postponed, uh, which is a serious thing uh, because, I mean, if it uh, turns out to be cancer, uh, then it's uh, serious for them, but they, they had to, they were ordered to keep all the beds free for the COVID-19 patients. And um, I, I thought that this is much more relevant right now than fiction. Um, because, I mean, yeah, what we considered uh, to be fiction is now real. So we have to uh, focus on reality right now. Do you agree with that, Paul? Um, I think there's a, yes. The short answer is yes. I think there's a very practical way in which uh, fiction writers, like everyone else, need to be engaged with reality. And it may be that this isn't a moment when we want to open up the spaces that, that only fiction opens for us. Or, as Jan suggests, maybe it's a moment when we, when we question the very existence of those spaces and say, well, if this thing can become real, what does that tell us about fiction? Or what does it tell us about reality? I'm inclined to think that there are still things that fiction does that journalism does not do. 
and that happen not, not only in fiction, but that happen mostly in fiction and that don't entirely translate into headlines even in the time of a pandemic. But whether this is the moment to voice those things or not, I don't know. It seems like the needs of the present are so pressing that, uh, you know, it's like being on a, a ship that's about to sink. You know, you, you really want to just make the ship not sink and uh and that that takes priority and then when you when you've done that if you ever can you uh you begin to return to the spaces of fiction although in fact as i say that i realize that i have i have maybe even some reservations about that and i feel like first of all the ship is always sinking so the ship is just sinking faster now but it's not, it, not like it wasn't sinking three months ago. And in the sense of there being, you know, pervasive crises and intractable problems and mass violence and horrible injustice and I don't know, all the other things that, and climate change and all the other things that could cause us to cease to exist as a, a species on this planet. Um, and then I think in a way, writers have something, fiction has something that it can do even now. Uh, and so for me, you know, I, I, it's, I, I wonder how much of this has to do with the fact that I don't live in a city. So my immediate surroundings are uh, trees and, and, and wild animals. Uh, but I don't feel the same urgency to go out and ask people to tell me their stories. Uh, I feel like I'm in a much more interior space as this, uh, the pandemic and then in the mass rioting in the US unfolds, that it sends me not out to, to find out what people think, which, which we have a whole like professional journalism core that's, that's handling that to the point where it seems like everybody, you know, everybody who wants to be interviewed can be interviewed in, in New York anyway. Um, it makes me want to turn in and think, well, what can I do as a fiction writer particularly? What can I do with what I actually have, with what I know how to do. Um, and then that, that's a question that I've been a little bit preoccupied with for the last few months. But maybe telling stories is part of these expertise and part of what writers can contribute, um, like making sense through telling stories. And I feel that in your novel, The Night Ocean, there, there I found it very interesting that there are various layers of fictionality somehow, which are being interlaced. So there are fake diaries, there are fictional interviews and characters who may or may not be dead. And so the novel stages a research process around the life of um, H.P. Lovecraft. And it is sometimes hard to tell what is real and what is made up. So as a reader, you're being trained to distrust the narrator was this effect intended? And maybe that's something that readers could take away for the current situation to deal with um, stories that we hear nowadays. Everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So I hadn't, I had been working on, on the night ocean for about uh, 10 years before it was published. And I had no intention of it being a, a timely work of fiction. It's, you know, it's a historical novel in some ways about uh, a relatively obscure pulp horror writer from the 20s and 30s. But it does have all of these layers of narrative which cast doubt upon one another and which turned out to be curiously relevant, uh, at least for American readers in the age of Trump, when questions about misinformation and disinformation are so foregrounded. We're wondering whether anything Trump says can be believed. No, I mean, we're not really wondering that. We already know the answer. But, but we're receiving such a vast quantity of of false information and then it's being uh, defended by a kind of broader attack on the the idea of fact or truth in general, right? It seems as though the strategy that Trump's team is deploying is we know you can't trust us, so we're going to make it impossible for you to trust anyone or anything. And you're going to have to consider everything to be fiction. Uh, and so this book that I was working on that that keep sort of telling stories that are very plausible and then undermining their, uh, their claim to truth, maybe perform some of that work of skepticism. Um, 
and it it makes a it, it might certainly if you know it would be nice from my point of view if it makes readers wary of buying too quickly into a story or honestly of buying too quickly into the refutation of a story right we have a very sort of there's a very simple reflex where if you say oh that person is making it up then everyone believes you Right, but you know, so there's a there's a kind of healthy skepticism about all of the different levels of framing. I think um, that I'm I'm interested in as a as a storyteller, as a writer of fiction, and that does seem like one of the places where telling made up stories about people who do or don't exist or exist in complicated ways can be sort of cognitively useful for readers thinking about. The, the troubled status of uh, the sort of consensus reality. Mm. Um, each of you has brought along a short text by another writer. Perhaps this would be a good moment for you, Paul, to share your text with sure. our audience. Yeah, so I think what I'd like to do is, uh, is to talk just for a second about how I came to uh, this text, which is Kafka's very, very short story on parables. Um, so I, I was thinking, you know, about precisely the question you just asked, Simona, about what can fiction do? What's the status of fiction in a world where we're so constantly being lied to and we're being invited to question the authority of everything and to, to associate truth not with some kind of referential, like, it's really like that, but more with like a sign of loyalty to a group. So it's like, I believe this because I identify as a, you know, liberal academic in the Northeastern United States, and that's my truth. Um, and I did a whole sort of series of contortions trying to think of anything that fiction could do in that space. And it finally led me to thinking that, uh, I mean, in a, in a way, in a very, very kind of straightforward way, it seems like what we need are like historians and psychotherapists, right? Really what would be helpful would be historians to say, you've done this all before, and psychotherapists to say, why don't you see it? And if we just had that, we'd probably be fine, right? Fiction in a weird way doesn't seem to have that much to tell us in this space, except then I came to this Kafka story, which I keep coming back to. I've read it over and over, over the years without ever really understanding it actually, which might kind of be the point. So let me read it and then I'll just, I'll say what I was thinking as I read it. On parables. Many complain that the words of the wise, here I'll, I'll move it around so I'm not staring off camera here. Many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, which is the only life we have. When the sage says, go over, he does not mean that we should cross to some actual place, which we could do anyhow if the labor were worth it. He means some fabulous yonder, something unknown to us, something that he cannot designate more precisely either, and therefore cannot help us here in the very least. All these parables set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible, and we know that already. But the cares we have to struggle with every day, that is a different matter. Concerning this, a man once said, why such reluctance? If you only followed the parables, you yourselves would become parables, and with that, rid of all your daily cares. Another said, I bet that is also a parable. The first said, you have won. The second said, but unfortunately, only in parable. The first said, no, in reality, in parable, you have lost. Which I think there's a whole lot of kind of mental gymnastics that need to take place to understand the, the, the whole story in just those last sentences. But to me, and I, I offer up this understanding of, of Kafka with, with the greatest hesitation and the, the certainty that I'll probably make even a larger fool of myself now than I did eating a chunk of wasabi. Um, on parables seems to be reminding us 
that the incomprehensible has a value in our lives and that the, the way to approach the incomprehensible may not be to drag it into the world of the ordinary and explicable, the world of our daily cares, the world of things that we can do and improve and solve and like, you know, we'll get from the beta release to the like 2.0 release, you know, everything will steadily get better. But that, that one, one way to approach the incomprehensible is simply to accept it and to say there are things that surpass our understanding. And if we're attentive to the world, we encounter them constantly, whether there's a pandemic or not. We're constantly faced with things that we have no capacity to understand. And when we, when we try to understand them, we're sort of kidding ourselves about the success of that attempt. And if we were able to, to get into the world of parable, the world of stories, the world where things are, are other than they are here, we might not solve the problems of our daily lives, but we might at least be able to step back from the urgency of solving them for a little bit and create a space from which to contemplate them, which would be less desperate. So that's, that's my two cents. Thank you so much. That's an amazing text. It, it feels a bit like a, a room full of mirrors to me. Um, yeah. I really, really enjoyed hearing it again. Uh, Jan, you've also brought along a text. Would you read it to us? Yes, it's, uh, it's the beginning of uh, the novel. Uh, he is my American Kafka, so to say. <laughs> it's like uh, Dennis Johnson's novel already dead and it's the beginning of the novel. The German translation is by Bettina Abba Barnell, but I will read from the original text. Uh, it's about uh, a guy called Carl Van Ness and uh, he's an ex-sailor who is on a suicidal trip uh, in uh, Northern California. He wants to kill himself, drown himself, um, but unfortunately in his case he gets rescued and that turns him into a kind of human demon. Um, but um, that's coming all after this passage. Vaness felt a gladness and wonder as he drove past the small isolated towns along US 101 in Northern California. A certain interest, a yearning, because he sensed they were places a person could disappear into. They felt like little naps you might never wake up from. You might throw a tire and hike to a gas station and stumble unexpectedly onto the rest of your life. The people who would finally mean something to you, a woman, an immortal friend, a saving fellowship in the religion of some obscure church. But such a thing as a small detour into deep and permanent changes at the time anyway, that he was traveling down the coast from Seattle into Mendocino County wasn't even to be dreamt of in Fanas's world. Yeah, for me, it, it's kind of, um, this novel is like, it has different layers as well and people are telling stories and it has a lot of characters. Um, and for me, it's like the beginning of this, uh, a novel is like in kind of a condensed version of what literature is for me. It's like a detour in daily life. As soon as you open up a book, you are entering a different world, like what Paul said about Kafka. You are kind of, uh, you are kind of doing this, um, um, you, you, you go over, you know, that's, that's the kind of step you take as soon as you open up a book and start reading. And, um, and yeah, sometimes books are like, you know, little naps you never wake up from. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and they are horror stories which, uh, you know, go around and around in your mind all the time. And uh, the good thing which com could come out of it is like you, you somehow get a tool that you can imagine things and that you can uh, rely on things and that you can uh, understand people uh, better uh, with literature because you are able to to set yourself in their view in their life 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that as well. And um, I've also got, I've got, actually got the same copy as you at home, um, also the German translation. Um, and I think it's curious that uh, the cover features an ocean. It's not really night, but um, perhaps this is not a coincidence. I know that you, Jan, have just been reading the night ocean. And do you care to share some impressions from your reading? Yeah, I find it very fascinating because uh, the night ocean always shifts between fiction and reality and you're never sure where you are and what really happened. And uh, I, I sometimes I found myself uh, with my uh, smartphone next to to me and you know kind of google all the people uh, paul is mentioning uh, googling if they really existed or not and uh, if the dates are correct uh, I'm, I'm working as a copywriter as well so i'm always kind of have this uh, thing going on in my mind and then uh, the novel uh, like turns around uh, 180 degrees it's like you are suddenly in a different uh, surrounding because uh, what he tells you is like everything you read was wrong, you know, and uh, now I tell you the real story. So um, you're always kind of shifting between, uh, you know, what is true and what is fake, and uh, it's about fake books, uh, it's about a hoax, and uh, what I find fascinating is that one of the main characters is H.P. Lovecraft, a horror fiction writer, and the book is like, uh, as soon as, you know, and, and the other one is a narrator and uh, her husband who wrote about uh, a, a relationship with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. And um, what I found fascinating is that the horrors Lovecraft created uh, are not as bad as the horrors li uh, like the internet or the, the shitstorms um, uh, created. I mean, uh, the main character is confronted with a shitstorm finally and and then this is a real monster you know and uh, i found it really fascinating that uh, this is something which has to do with my daily life this can happen to me as well so this is a, a monster i have to be afraid of uh, in in my life and not in a kind of a fictional way um, and that that's a kind of fascinating way uh, how paul did this on these different layers that you're always kind of like Kafka you're always walking on a kind of insecure ground you never know where you are and what's going on Lovecraft as a person had his dark sides there are hmm. problems to the views that he held to put it mildly um, what what drew you to this writer Paul oh I uh, you know I was drawn to him at an age when one uh, hopefully doesn't, isn't required to exercise good judgment. You know, I was probably 10 or 11 years old and the the kind of horror and apocalyptic uh, uh, cosmos that he created for his books resonated with me as a, a kid growing up in New York in the 1980s. You know, I felt very much like, sure, monsters from space are probably going to kill everyone. You know, that's kind of how I feel every day. So why don't I read stories about it? It was only much later that I um, understood the, uh, the, you know, that I learned about Lovecraft's biography and then knowing his biography as a, uh, just a really uh, quite virulent racist um, and uh, anti-Semite and misogynist and some other things. Uh, I was, you know, I, I had to go back and look at his stories and I, once you look, of course you, you see traces of those things in the stories. But I feel like, you know, honestly, answering your question from June of 2020, I feel like this is an education that many white Americans are undergoing right now, right? That we like took something for granted and thought it was kind of cool and we didn't look too deeply into it. We just kind of celebrated it. And then we learned a little bit about the backstory and realized that it was deeply, deeply problematic and we were faced with a crisis of like, what to do? Do we go on just celebrating it and thinking it's cool? Or do we go back and, and think about it with some critical consciousness? And for me, you know, I can't go back. I can't not go back. I have to go back with the critical consciousness and say, oh, this is actually quite disturbing and messed up. And it's 
like it really, it, it resonated with my experience as a kid because I grew up in a racist country and that's like where I was, you know? Um, so, so it's been a whole, a whole process of self-examination for me. Um, but I also, uh, e even more than Lovecraft, was just drawn to the, the other principal historical figure in that, who is this young poet and anthropologist named Robert Barlow, who lived a very sad but also very vivid life. And I, I feel quite sympathetic towards him, and I wanted to write about his, his, uh, his world. It's interesting that science fiction is also something that you share in, in Jan's debut novel. Um, it also plays a certain role. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to move on to um, the, the responsibility that you, you have for characters um, that exist in, in the real world. I think you, Paul, um, managed to do this wonderfully by um, by this interlacing of different levels of fictionality and different types of stories and telling. Jan, what is it like for you? You also write as a journalist, um, but um, as an author, you've published memoirs where you write about people who really exist. Um, do you feel that you there's a different responsibility that comes with writing um, as a fiction writer or non-fiction literary writer than as a journalist. Yes, definitely. Um, I have a different attitude when I write a journal um, because I want to be as accurate as possible. And uh, because, I mean, they are like real people and there are almost no changes uh, in my stories. Um, I have in, in my latest book about my uh, my apartment in Berlin and my um, my, my home in uh, Ostfriesland. I had to make like kind of forced changes. Um, the kind of uh, law department of my publisher said you have to change the names of the of the people and you have to change places. Uh, it's about my my uh, I got um, I got kicked off, out of my apartment in Berlin and. Um, uh, because the landlord uh, claimed to um, to need it for himself or his son, and I had the feeling that that's not true, uh, but I, I had to prove him false, which is very difficult. Um, so um, anyway, I, I was looking for an apartment for like 10 months in Berlin, um, and it was very difficult for me to find one because I'm a writer, I'm a freelancer, I'm... Uh, um, I'm, I'm on my own, so I, ha I don't have a regular income, which is not very uh, uh, an advantage in this market. So um, I was, I'm describing all these kind of uh, uh, situations where I was looking uh, apartments and um, my publisher said, you know, you have to change the names of the, of the people you met. And um, that's what I did. And, so, and I also had to change the name of my landlord and uh, write him a kind of fictional background. Um, I hated that because I, I wanted to be as true as possible, but in this case, it was impossible uh, not to do it. And in, in fiction, it's different. I mean, I'm, I'm using real people, but I kind of mix them into uh, more complex characters. Uh, and um, I, I not only change their names, it's like uh, a kind of mesh up of different people. But although I'm, I was very afraid of the result when I published my first novel, which is called Against the World, and it's, a, it's about a very um, angry young man in, in, this home, in, in my hometown. So I thought that, you know, I got a kind of, there would be a kind of lynch mob uh, when this book would come out. Uh, but uh, the thing is, the, the novel is too big to be read. I think it's like a thousand pages. So when it came out, nobody read it. And um, yeah, to be kind of awarded for a prize, um, nominated for a prize, that was like um, something they, they, you know, admired me. Uh, I, I didn't want to, I, I didn't thought that that would happen. I wanted them to, to hate me, but uh, it, it turned out the different way. <laughs> the novel is too big to be read. I, I love this. Um, writing a super long novel to protect yourself against shitstorms or aggressions. 
Um, I'm afraid we're already running out of time, or to put it differently, we're opening up the floor for our audience. Um, and there are already, the first questions have already arrived. Um, so please feel free to um, write down your questions in the comment section and uh, don't be shy. Um, I think it is um, um, only we, the um, panelists, can see the questions. So if you can't see any questions, um, nothing is wrong, just type in your question. And um, I'm going to start reading out the first one. It's um, a bit lengthy. I'm, going, I'm just going to read it out to Jan and Paul. So thank you for this insightful discussion. The writer Dean Kohns and the film Contagion have been mentioned in the news recently with reference to conspiracy theorists who say these fictional works predicted the coronavirus, at least in part. This and your conversation led me to think more about the boundaries between fiction and nonfiction. Is it possible that reality could unexpectedly mirror a piece of fiction to the extent that the fiction becomes nonfiction? Hmm. Um. I mean, I think, speaking for myself, I think it's uh, it's not at all unexpected that that would be the case, because fiction writers are uh, often doing an enormous amount of work to make their stories uh, fit into the real world and to mesh with the real world. I know that I did a you know a, a fair amount of research for the Night Ocean Yan. I know that you're in the middle of this rather monumental research project to write about your family or, or even in, in a fictive form because you want to capture the the minutia, the texture of their lives, the experiences that they had, the things that you would be unable to simply imagine, you know, from your apartment in Berlin. So there's this enormous painstaking labor of kind of informing yourself about the world that goes into writing fiction. And so no surprise that that you know, the world then sort of resembles fiction. But the other part of it is that fiction represents desire at some level, right? It's, it's what we want to happen. Even these apocalyptic stories, I think, are stories about things we would like to happen. It would be great if 99% of the people on the planet would just go away and they'd like leave us all the stuff. And also we wouldn't have to go to work anymore you know, and we'd be able to shape like a new meaningful life for ourselves uh, in the aftermath of this disaster. That's a, it's a horror story, but it's also a fantasy. It's a wish, right? I would love to not have to like, you know, squeeze my way onto the subway at rush hour. And I would love to, you know, not whatever, engage with late capitalism all the time. Um, and the wish, those wishes aren't by any means unique to fiction writers, right? It's something that lots and lots of people want. And curiously, it turns out that if lots and lots of people want something, you can, they can make it happen. I don't think we made the coronavirus happen, but, but it does appear in a way in response, not only to things we fear, but to things that we want and to things that we would be glad to have. Jan, is there anything you would like to add, or shall I move on? Yeah, I had to. I had to think about the image Paul referred to uh, as a ship we are on, and uh, I think that writers are some kind of uh, lifeguards on this ship, who tell the, the passengers, you know, what could happen, uh, worst case, uh, and uh, and um, they, they tell them stories, you know, they tell them horror stories in order to to um, to rescue them, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that fiction is always mirroring reality and uh, reality is somehow referring to fiction. Uh, I mean, you can, you can see it in these kind of conspiracy theorists who always uh, kind of um, um, point to uh, the fiction everyone knows and, and we grow up to. I mean, they are telling amazing stories all the time and think that they are true. So, um, uh, I think there's always a kind of mirror uh, and, and always a kind of, a kind of very thin wall between the two worlds. Yeah, I love that we're like, you know, the normal lifeguard's job is to say everything is gonna be all right. But our job is to be, we're like the bad lifeguards. <laughs> we're like the ones who are like, you should actually be really afraid. I don't know why you're not wearing a life vest. Yeah. 
Yeah. Speaking of life vests, another uh, member of the audience asked for book recommendations. Um, so um, this person asking, have you read any particular books during the recent weeks that helped you process everything that's been going on? Um, Jan, you want to field that one? You mean, um, I mentioned uh, it's about this corona time, about, about COVID-19, the, the, the lockdown. I was actually not reading any books about the pandemic. Uh, I was so shocked by the pandemic. Uh, although I, 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 I read about uh, the, the extensively about the Spanish flu uh, in earlier times, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I read Stephen King's The Stand uh, uh, long before this, and um, it's about the pandemic, uh, and it's a horror novel. So I'm, I, I, I think that um, all these books helped me understanding uh, what was going on. Uh, but as soon as this happened, I wasn't able to, to go back to this, because I was overwhelmed by the development of uh, what happened. Um, in reality, and uh, I think uh, I was I, I tended I tended more to to rom coms uh, for in, for instance, and to kind of books which uh, kept me comfortable comfortable uh, instead of uh, making me nervous and uh, anxious. Yeah. Um, another person is is asking. Um, that it seems to them that you have been talking about two different kinds of making sense. Paul has addressed the question of narrative, finding arguments that are acceptable, relying on time, and Jan has spoken about fact-checking, wondering whether names attached to real person or fictional ones. This does not involve time as much as issues of reference any comments, so this is not, not really um, a question, it's more of a comment, so would you care to comment or? Well, I think that the, the uh, I, I don't think that these are kind of two opposite things, um, because um, I mean, like like this time is like that you have a bigger longing for a narrative, uh, what, what is going on, you, you need to understand what is going on, and I, um, and most of other people, they kind of rely on experts like scientists uh, to tell them how a virus works because I don't know how it, work, how it works and I can, can't imagine how it works. So I need these people to tell me. Um, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm an expert on, on narratives. So that's what I can rely on. And, uh, um, and I, th I think you have still these two, two sides. Uh, you need some kind of, um, uh, how do you say it in, in English, a Blaupause, uh, which, is, which is a book uh, about a pandemic, and, and then you know what's, what could happen. Um, and, and you can't check this because it's a kind of science, science fiction thing or it's a kind of utopian uh, imagination. Um. If I can just follow on that, I, I agree with Jan, and also uh, hi Lilian. I can see from your from your username who that is, um, and I miss you. Uh, for me, the 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 two are also completely intermeshed, and the the status of an individual fact is you know is often hotly contested. Um, did Trump wear a mask at the mask factory? You know, we, we debate and go back and forth and no one can agree. Um, but, but that contestation feels to me like it's a symptom of a kind of narrative that's happening about the world, that we're telling stories. You know, I've, I'm reluctant even to try to characterize them, but that often the stories that we're telling feel to me like they're about, uh, they belong to particular demographics. Right, that this is the story that this tribe tells. This is the story that this sect tells. This is the story that this affinity group tells. And that there's something about the kind of larger social picture in which the narratives are being built, which then puts a great deal of pressure on these questions about fact and fiction. Um, but that that pressure in some way feels to me like it's symptomatic of something else that's going on, uh, a different, sense of commonality or an absence of commonality. Uh, 
a kind of restructuring of power relations so that we're not living in a, a hegemony where, uh, uh, you know, the old white guys get to tell us what's true and we don't accept that and we're sort of like actively engaged in not accepting it. Um, all of those sort of larger narratives, it seems to me, are, are informing our sense of, of what counts as a fact and whose facts we accept and where we get our facts and how we would ascertain whether something is a fact or not. And Jan, I probably shouldn't say this, but when you were looking things up about the night ocean, I should warn you that I wrote some of those Wikipedia pages. What? <laughs> no, <laughs> a little bit shameless, but yes. There are, you know, I mean, at some level, it's all just, it's all just intrigue. You changed the internet. I'm shocked. Tiny, a tiny little bit. Oh. A tiny little bit. It's all one large text, I suppose. There's a lot of internet. <laughs> the two next questions about are about the, um, the type of literary stories that emerge from the current pandemic situation. And um, I would like to um, refer to an article by Jan that I enjoyed very much. So maybe a German um, listeners might want to check it out. It was published 10 years ago in the Süddeutsche Zeitung and you can still find it online. And Jan writes about um, how he finds it curious that there are almost no literary works um, about the Spanish flu, which um, killed over half a million people in Germany in 1918. And um, there are almost no novels about this. Um, so um, I'm going to join the, 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 the audience questions in asking, um, do you think this will be different with the current pandemic? Will there be stories? Will there be novels? And what type of dystopian fiction novels will there be? Well, I can't foresee the future, obviously, but uh, going back into history, I, I think that uh, it was like, um, for me, it was like a surprise that there wasn't a big novel, uh, a German novel or a big American novel about uh, this pandemic uh, in 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu. Um, so I did a, a lot of research on this topic and um, uh, the first accounts on, on this uh, were in a, in a big American novel like Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel, but it was just one part of it, one chapter. And uh, then it, it took another 10 years uh, when the first novels came out, like William Maxwell's uh, They Came Like Swallows or Catherine N. Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider. But even those are very small novels. And... Um, in Germany, I mean, Franz Kafka, for example, he was infected, or Alfred Döblin, he was a, a doctor, he was dealing with patients, and um, he wrote a, a really huge novel called November 1918, but that was about the whole war and the end of the war, and even there, um, the, the pandemic was just a very small scene. Um, I think it had to do with uh, the narrative um, or, or the lack of the narrative. I mean, there was this huge war and that was like overwhelming everyone. And it was overwhelming uh, the narrative because, uh, yeah, it was too big and uh, you, could, you, you could blame people for that. You, you couldn't blame anyone for this flu. And uh, science wasn't as far as it is now. So um, the research wasn't as good as it is now. So I think that the books which will come out of this pandemic would be quite different and uh, different in many ways because I mean they on the one hand they have to be bigger than uh, the fiction we already have like Stephen King's The Stand or other big novels uh, and on the other hand they have to tell us something new about ourselves so I think it's a big uh, achievement for writers and I don't envy anyone who is like going to start uh, writing a book uh, about that right now. And I think we will see the first good books dealing with, it, with this in 10 years time. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. I think that like Jan, I was uh, physically, like emotionally and intellectually overwhelmed by the reality of the pandemic to the point where reading about it feels completely superfluous. And I think that'll remain true for some time. I don't think that, that there's going to be a hunger to read a great pandemic novel in November 
when the second wave of the pandemic, you know, hits. Um, and I also wonder what kind of world we'll be in, you know, in 10 years time when the possibility for that novel comes into being and whether whether great novels will have a, a place in our, our mental landscapes or whether we'll all be looking for the great video game about the pandemic, you know, or the great TV series, uh, sadly, about the pandemic, which will, you know, inevitably get made, whether it's great or not. Um, but I wonder, I, I don't know, I, I wonder kind of uh, anxiously about the, the future of, of literary discourse and whether whether people 10 years from now, you know, whatever world we're there in, will want a novelist to come back and say, this is what you live through. Um, I'm afraid this is so interesting, but we, we are running out of time. Um, there are two more questions have just popped up. Um, so I'm just going to um, read them out since it's al already past six o'clock and then maybe you can um, just answer to, to them together. Or, um, yeah. So one question is, isn't a factor in the absence of novels about the pandemic, World War I and overwhelming suffering? Um, that said, what about Mrs. Dalloway? And then another question is, um, Oh, yes, uh, sorry, just a second. Um, what is the responsibility of writers right now in this situation in contrast to journalists? Hmm. These are big questions. I mean, maybe um, um, we, we, we well, leave it at that and give these questions to the audience to, to take home and to have something to think about. Um, if, if I could risk... Uh, sort of ending with a something that may seem like a platitude. I, I have no information about the pandemic. I love Mrs. Dalloway, no opinion. Um, but about the responsibility of writers, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what I can do right, right now. Um, what can I do that will be of any use? Which is, I think, maybe another way of asking the same question. What's my responsibility? What, how do I, how do I like maintain my part of the social contract? And the only answer I come up with is that I, that my responsibility is to keep asking the question. I know it's a little simple minded. It's a little banal, but it doesn't seem to me that as a fiction writer, once I, I make a kind of definite statement about my responsibility, I am like, I'm, I'm engaging in socialist realism and my work becomes boring. And it sort of loses its, its capacity to do whatever it was going to do in the first place. Um, I think for journalists, it's quite different. And there are fiction writers who are also journalists, right? I mean, Jan uh, among them. So that the, there's a, you know, you're, you're working in two very different spaces. But I think for a fiction writer, that question is, is vital, but it's also very hard to answer categorically. Well, I think, I think that, uh, you know, kind of going back to the two writers we mentioned, uh, Franz Kafka and Dennis Johnson, uh, I would say that journalists uh, have to write about what's going on now, about reality, about uh, the real things, about the facts, and uh, stick to them. And uh, the fiction writers, uh, they have to go over, you know, enter the room of imagination or, you know, take the detour. Uh, to places where you've never been to and uh, probably you never uh, uh, go back uh, and, and stay and uh, stay there and stick to fiction. I think this is a beautiful note to end on. So thank you very much, Paul and Jan. Thank you for all your questions, dear audience. And I think it's time for a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and for me to hand over to Barrett. So thank you, everyone. If Barrett is ready, that is. But I'm sure she is. Here I am. Here I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I will end this uh, most, uh, first and foremost by thanking three of you. Thank you for being part of that 
our first experiment here. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Stefan von Holzbring for um, funding and financing the Holzbring Fellowship without uh, which, which we would not have had Paul here at the Academy and also not here at the Academy in, <laughs> in the United States. Um, and I would like to thank my two colleagues, um, Mareike and Johanna, who are right now with me. Um, the wonderful um, um, mechanism of new technology makes it possible, which is not possible during an event, that I show them to you right now. Here they are. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you and thank you everybody for joining. Um, perhaps we will see each other again on June 25th, where we will have our next online event with economist Jeffrey Sachs, who will talk about a new way forward for global cooperation. And uh, with that, thank you. <laughs>